Tonight, millions come together to cheer on the underdogs. Canada's men and their World Cup comeback, decades in the making. The close calls and fierce pride as Canada returns to soccer's biggest stage. Alberta demands the head of the RCMP be fired. What the commissioner says tonight. And they fled Iran for Canada. Now they say the dangers have followed them here. How would they have known that? I'm not sure. What else did they know about you? A rare look at the real risks they face. What's wrong with the government? Why they are not taking action? This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for being with us tonight. Canada's men are back at the World Cup and back with a powerful message for the soccer world. This team is for real. <laughs> Canadians across the country were glued to their screens this afternoon to watch Canada play in the tournament for the first time in 36 years. And not only did they play, Canada gave top-ranked Belgium a serious fight on the pitch. Thomas Degla is in Qatar for us tonight with thousands of other Canadians all angling for a win. A sea of red outside the stadium and flashes of that maple leaf sent the soccer world a message. Canada is finally here. I'm here to enjoy the fact that Canada's in the World Cup finally. Because that's what it's all about, right? You know, first World Cup goal. You know, I think the place is going to erupt. Fans have been waiting 36 years to cheer for their own team. Now they're savoring the moment. To see our boys in red take the pitch, the emotions are going to hit me. It's, it's absolutely a, unbelievable. It's a real experience to experience this in Qatar. Uh, we're super excited. Canadians by the thousands taking their devotion to Bin Ali Stadium, where the mighty Belgium awaited, ready for a battle on the global stage. From the start, Canada came on strong, drawing an early penalty kick with superstar Alfonso Davies primed to score his team's first World Cup goal. But a dramatic diving stop by Belgian goalkeeper Thibaut Courtois sent Canadians' hearts sinking. Making matters worse, Belgian Michi Batshuayi getting the ball past Canada's Milan Borjan late in the first half. And in the second, Deja vu for Canada, with Kyle Lowren's well-placed header shut down by the Belgian keeper, ensuring his team's 1-0 win. Canada coach John Herdman reassuring his men after they kept a soccer powerhouse at bay for much of the match. So close. Fans agreed. Never has a loss looked so encouraging. To lose one nothing to Belgium, it's a great team. I would take that every day. Game was really good. I wasn't expecting Canada to play so good. With disappointment comes solace, knowing Canada now stands a real shot against its next opponents, Croatia and Morocco, both ranked lower than Belgium. I think we're gonna we're gonna surprise some people. This is yeah. just the beginning. It's been a long road to get here. What's one more bump along the way? So Thomas, you've been speaking with fans who saw this all in person. What's your sense of what this moment's been like for them? It's not just been an exciting moment, it has been emotional. So many people talking uh, about getting goosebumps in the arms and tears in their eyes. Keep in mind, many of these fans have been supporting Canada's men's team for decades through many ups and downs. And I think a lot of Canadian soccer fans would tell you they are so used to supporting uh, clubs in the big European leagues or other countries in international tournaments and they may have been reminded today that nothing gets you invested in a match quite like rooting for your own country at the World Cup. Now in terms of what's next for Canada, coach John Herdman tonight used colorful language to tell his players that they will destroy the Croatian team who they play on Sunday. Adrian. All right, Thomas Dagla in Doha. Thanks, Thomas. From the Canadians watching in Doha to the fans watching right across this country, Lisa Shing shows us how they packed bars, patios, and school auditoriums. From unbridled excitement <laughs> to nail-biting anxiety, Fans across the country were with Team Canada every step of the way. For some, it meant switching loyalties. I'm Peruvian, Italian, those are our teams, but now Canada is 
We are so excited. At the moment, I'm cheering for the Canada, but uh, in the, as overall, I support my Korean team, of course. In Toronto, soccer legend and Women's World Cup veteran Christine Sinclair watched nervously with the crowd. Just as a Canadian and as a soccer fan, I've been waiting for this for a long time. Let's go Canada! Good luck, Fonzie! And if there was ever a day to play hooky, this was it, especially for these Edmonton students at star player Alfonso Davies' old school. He is such a star and an idol to everyone, and everyone pushes and strives to be like him. Even though Canada lost this match, its long-awaited return to soccer's biggest stage is still considered a win for many fans impressed by their team's performance on the field. I felt Canada did amazing. I'm yeah. very proud, yeah. Is this still a win in a way? I feel like it's a win, yes. Heartbreaking a little bit, but like, hey, that's the number two ranked uh, country in the world. They just lost one nil to. I'm a bit ticked about it with the penalty miss, but what can you do, man? Like, the pressure's on and uh, it's a lot to take for, uh, for the players and for the world, right? Everyone that's watching. In Brampton, Ontario, where seven of Team Canada's players are from, there's an extra sense of pride. The world is taking notice because they didn't expect Canada to do this far. Canada still has time to make it even further. We're Canadians, we're proud, we're going to get this Sunday. For these fans, that game can't come soon enough. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. And in a major upset, Japan beat Germany in their opener today in a match that began with a statement. German players covered their mouths in a team photo before the game an apparent rebuke against FIFA's ban on players wearing One Love armbands to protest discrimination in Qatar. Germany's interior minister was seen wearing one in the stands. After trailing most of the game, Japan rallied late in the second half to win 2-1. Now to new revelations tonight out of the Emergencies Act inquiry in Ottawa. Liberal cabinet ministers had their text messages projected onto the big screen, giving new insight into how the government was handling last winter's convoy protest behind the scenes. And as Olivia Stefanovic shows us, talk of using the act came up pretty early. Top federal ministers on the stand. Do you swear? That and you on the defense. You? Yes, I do. I do swear. I do. To face their own words spelled out in text messages. You make again in, in, in stark... Uh, terms, the observation slowly is incompetent. The justice minister says he sent that comment about then Ottawa Police Chief Peter Slowly in the heat of the moment. I was frustrated, I have to admit. But David Lametti says the protesters harassed his staff and death threats against him increased dramatically. One of the texts that drew the most attention, an exchange between Lametti and his chief of staff showing they began discussing the Emergencies Act two weeks before it was used. The second or third day of the protest, and your mind goes straight to the Emergencies Act. Can you explain uh, why that came so quickly to your mind? I was being prudent. A few days later, Lametti brought up the emergency legislation again. In case we need it, because the worst scenario would be something explodes, and we are not ready to use it. Lametti also told the public safety minister, you need to get the police to move and the Canadian Armed Forces if necessary. Marco Mendicino replied, how many tanks are you asking for? Lametti said, I reckon one will do. It is meant to be a joke between two friends. Do you agree with Minister Lametti? The question was put to the defense minister Canadian also testifying. The Canadian Armed Forces is the force of last resort. Welcome to Ottawa, make yourself at home. By February 13th, conversations turned much more serious. Lametti again texted his chief of staff, saying, quote, we are on the inexorable march to the Emergencies Act. It was invoked the next day. So Olivia, I think we got a better sense today of when the Justice Minister considered the Emergencies Act, but, but didn't explain why. That's right, Adrian. The minister said he couldn't get into the legal reasoning, citing solicitor-client privilege. And that was frustrating for the commission's lawyer, whose job is to figure out if the government was justified in invoking the act. We did, however, hear that Transport Minister Omar Al-Gabra told his U.S. counterpart just days before the government used its special emergency powers that Ottawa would soon intervene if nothing was done. 
And tomorrow we hear from the Prime Minister's top advisors and Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland. And on Friday, it's Justin Trudeau. All right, Olivia Stefanovic in Ottawa. Thanks, Olivia. You're welcome. Public hearings at that inquiry have been going on for six weeks now. We've learned a lot of information about how police struggled to respond in the early days and disagreements played out between levels of government, all as everyone scrambled to get control of the situation. So in about half an hour, we're going to lay out what we've learned and what that might mean for the future. Now, those hearings play a part in our next story, too. Alberta's Justice Minister is calling for the head of the RCMP to be fired. Marina von Stackelberg begins with a reaction from Canada's top Mountie. Brenda Lucky was asked if she'll resign. Well, I, I'm not going to comment directly on, on that. I, I, I'm not going to step down from my position. The Alberta government wants Lucky fired. It says she's failed to meet what it calls the most meager standards as head of the RCMP. There's been a lot of coverage of uh, Commissioner Lucky's lack of action. Lucky was appointed in 2018, the first woman to permanently hold the job. She inherited a force grappling with internal issues, allegations of abuse and racism. Since then, she's had her own controversies. She's been criticized with not tackling racism within the ranks, especially toward Indigenous people. The swearing in. Uh, Last week at the inquiry into the Canadian government's use of the Emergencies Act, she testified that she believed police could still shut down the protests using existing laws. But she never told Cabinet that directly the night before the act was invoked. Do you appreciate the significance of that scenario? Uh, yes and no, because we had spoken about the fact that we had an integrated planning cell, that we were bringing together a plan. The federal government says it has confidence in Lucky. The public safety minister says he's not firing her. There are, will be a, obviously a discussion uh, with the commissioner uh, as, as, her, as her current defined term uh, comes, uh, comes to its, uh, its, its natural conclusion. Um, and uh, and uh, we'll see where that takes us. Lucky also faces allegations she interfered in the investigation of the Nova Scotia mass shooting by pushing the local RCMP to release details of the weapons used as the Liberal government prepared gun legislation. Lucky denies those allegations. I will keep working towards uh, keeping the confidence of the government and keeping the confidence of Canadians. This comes as Alberta considers creating its own police force to replace the RCMP. The minister says his call for Lucky to resign is unrelated. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. Police in Montreal are investigating a disturbing hit and run caught on video. It's jarring to watch, but you need to know, thankfully, no one was seriously injured. So police release this video where you can see a woman pushing a stroller with a baby in it. A car approaches and then appears to accelerate hitting the stroller and dragging it for several meters before it came loose from the vehicle. The mother of the baby, she was pushing her. Um, she was coming down right there and the car hit her head on, hit the stroller. And she was very, very shocked, obviously as a normal mother should, would be. I mean, it shouldn't happen to any mother. Now, police say they think they've determined how it is the baby wasn't seriously hurt. The thing that did that is that he was well attached in that stroller, which probably saved a lot of uh, damage to, uh, to him. Investigators are now asking the public for help identifying the driver. Friends and family are mourning the death of a Canadian teenager killed in Jerusalem. Arie Shupak died in one of two explosions on the outskirts of the city today. He was 16 years old. Those twin explosions wounded at least 18 others. And as Sasha Petrosik explains, the violence is prompting condemnation and real concern. Two powerful blasts, half an hour apart, shook the outskirts of Jerusalem. The first at one bus stop, the loud boom of the second, startling motorists far from the explosion at another bus shelter. The attacks came as Israelis were going to work and school, killing 16-year-old Aryeh Shupak as he headed to Bible study. Shupak was an Israeli-Canadian teen remembered by his former teachers in Edmonton and by his father at the funeral a few hours later. just want to say bye to my son, Aryeh. The death of this young Canadian 
was denounced by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in a tweet. Canada condemns this violence in the strongest possible terms, he wrote. For Israelis, the bombings are a grim reminder of the kind of organized attacks Palestinian militants used to launch years ago. Like back then, Israeli officers say these bombs were sophisticated and coordinated, packed with nails, making them deadlier. Militant groups, including Hamas, praised the bombings, though they stopped short of claiming responsibility. But the political reaction was swift. Incoming Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowing a tough response. His ultra-nationalist coalition partner, Itamar Ben-Gvir, insisting on laying siege to Palestinian militants in the occupied West Bank. In that occupied West Bank, that could escalate the confrontation that's been brewing all year, bringing its own grief. Also on Wednesday, Palestinians buried a 16-year-old of their own, Ahmad Shahada, who was killed in a clash with Israeli soldiers just before the twin bombs hit Jerusalem. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Millions of Ukrainians are in the dark after a series of Russian missiles knocked out power across the country. And as you're about to see, at least six people were killed. As Briar Stewart tells us, Ukrainians are being warned to expect more attacks and more blackouts. On the outskirts of Kyiv, the latest victims of what Moscow calls its attack on critical infrastructure. Among the dead, a 17-year-old girl. Hours earlier in the country south, another deadly strike. This was a maternity ward. A new mother was evacuated from the second floor, said this rescue official. Unfortunately, a newborn who was just two days old died. Russia rained down dozens of missiles on Ukraine Wednesday, plunging entire cities into darkness. Although it wasn't directly hit, neighboring Moldova experienced blackouts too. At one time, half the country was without power. Bye. Anything might happen, thanks to Mr. Putin, he says. Mr. Putin. The strikes meant Ukraine had to shut down three of its nuclear power plants, and residents were once again warned to be prepared for prolonged outages. Unfortunately, this will continue. Yuri Sak is an advisor to Ukraine's Minister of Defense. Everybody is stocking up on you know things like drinking water warm clothes uh, batteries generators you name it ukraine is working to set up hubs where people can go to get warm and charge devices if needed but in cities like Kherson, they're also offering a ride out an offer to go to other parts of ukraine it's so difficult my apartment is cold and there's no heating says this woman Europe's parliament voted to designate Russia a state sponsor of terrorism, a largely symbolic move. Around the same time, the deputy chairman of Russia's Security Council was touring a missile factory, scoffing at the suggestion by some Western intelligence officials that Russia is running out of weapons. There's enough for everyone, he later said. But it's Ukraine that's been the target for nine months, and this is another day that ends with darkness and grief. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. On the eve of U.S. Thanksgiving, that country is being rocked by a second high-profile mass shooting in less than a week. This one claiming the lives of at least six people. Katie Simpson shows us the grieving in Virginia and the search for justice in Colorado. New tributes for a familiar pain. This time, it's Walmart employees gunned down on the job. Investigators are trying to figure out why a shift manager brought a pistol into the break room and opened fire. By the grace of God, I made it and all the other people I knew made it. Literally just walked out the place he shot up. It happened around 10 p.m. Walmart was packed with last minute Thanksgiving shoppers and staff. Police arrived to find victims all over the store and the gunman dead of a suspected self-inflicted gunshot wound. Heavenly Father. The Republican governor of Virginia led a prayer for the victims and their families, insisting now is not the time to talk about solutions to gun violence. There has just been a, a moment that families could never imagine. It's unimaginable uh, what they're dealing with today. 
But what is more imaginable than a mass shooting in America? Thank you. The first responders were extensively prepared. We train for it. We practice. We talk about it. We discuss. We learn lessons from other places. This shooting happened three days after five people were murdered in a Colorado LGBTQ bar. Could the defendant please state his name? In a first brief court appearance, the Club Q shooting suspect was hard to understand. Anderson Aldrich sat in a wheelchair, still clearly injured. A new mugshot shows cuts and bruises after being subdued by bar patrons. Lawyers revealed Aldrich is non-binary and uses they, them pronouns. Prosecutors say that will not impact the possibility of bias-motivated charges. A neighbor says Aldrich had been known to say hateful things about the LGBTQ community, information that is now with the FBI. There have been more than 600 mass shootings in the U.S. so far in 2022, the third straight year that number has been reached. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. As protesters in Iran face a violent crackdown, Iranians in this country say they are under threat here too. I know multiple people that have been getting multiple death threats. Dissidents say their lives are still in danger. Maybe they are already here. You think it's like a physical surveillance? Yes, exactly. How some are being targeted right here in Canada and their calls for help. Plus, what have weeks of testimony revealed about the failure to stop Ottawa's occupation? We're going into this as, as people who have just had enough and we're, go we're not going to leave. David Common and the lessons learned. And the race to find out what is killing humpback whales in British Columbia. I was mad because it doesn't have to happen. We're back in two. An urgent plea tonight from Canada's health minister for parents to get their kids vaccinated. And we know it is particularly valuable right now as our children are suffering for all, from all sorts of respiratory viruses. It's mostly flu and RSV infections hitting kids harder than usual. But of course, there's also COVID. All of this putting immense pressure on hospitals right now. While there's no widely available vaccine for RSV, the minister is urging parents to get their kids the COVID and flu shots. It is the spread of avian flu raising concern in B.C. tonight. 14 poultry farms have confirmed new cases in the last week. Its ability to spread uh, and get into barns is devastating on, on poultry. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency says overall 23 infected farms in the province are in quarantine. Some in the Fraser Valley where millions of birds were culled in 2004 due to the same disease. This year, a new, harsher strain is to blame for larger outbreaks in North America and Europe. No human cases have been detected in this country. And on B.C.'s shore, at least four humpback whales have been found dead. Lindsay Duncombe now with the urgent work underway to find out why. This young female humpback washed up in late October. Injuries suggest she may have been hit by a large boat. One of at least four humpback whales found dead on remote stretches of BC's coast in the last six weeks. So that is definitely a blip and, and a lot more than we see in a short time. Necropsies will determine how the animals died. Two showed evidence of blunt force trauma. It's a sad turn in a story of remarkable recovery. It used to be legal to hunt whales. These images from downtown Vancouver in the 60s. Since that was banned, the population of humpbacks on BC's coast has more than tripled. It's estimated there are now as many as 20,000 animals, and that means more human-whale interaction. Entanglements in nets and gear, also a problem. We're even teaching a voter course right now. And I start the voter course with how many of you have almost hit a humpback and up go all the hands. Jackie Hildering is a humpback whale researcher. She says boaters need to understand humpbacks behave differently than other whales. Yeah, they could be resting right below the surface. They could be nursing right below the surface. 
They are going in big, unpredictable patterns. Environmental organization OceanWise says anyone who sees a humpback should record it in this app, information it sends directly to navigation systems. CEO Lassa Gustafson also wants to see more ships use infrared whale sensing technology. And this is a tragedy because this can be avoided. The sad truth is most dead whales sink. So as bad as the situation appears, it's likely worse. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Canada's spy agency has confirmed the threats are real. Maybe they are already here. You think it's like a physical surveillance? Yes, exactly. Up next, we speak with Iranian dissidents struggling to feel safe in this country. Plus, what did it really take to end the occupation in Ottawa? We'll look at the key takeaways from the Emergencies Act inquiry. The crackdown on protests in Iran has triggered horror and fear beyond Iran's borders. Even here, people are looking over their shoulders. There are clear signs the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, an arm of the Iranian military known for torturing, even murdering activists who speak out against the regime, has reached its way into Canada. Well, tonight in a special report, we speak with some of those at risk who say the government isn't doing enough to help. A protest in Halifax about brutality in Iran. You would hope people would feel and be safe doing this in Canada. At least that's how it should be. We are together. This is the time. I call on Canadian government to protect my fellow activists in Canada because I know that their life is in danger. Making an appearance, Iranian activist Masiya Alinejad, who now lives in the U.S. and lives under guard. In 2019, the FBI revealed a plot to assassinate her in the States. That same investigation had disturbing news for Iranian activists in Canada. They told me that the same group were trying to uh, kidnap, harass the Iranian Canadian activists. The threats were specific, a plot to kidnap three people in Canada. CSIS has now confirmed that report and those threats. None of this surprises some Iranians in Canada who've been scared for a while. You mentioned that you have this feeling that the Revolutionary Guard are, are kind of keeping an eye on you here. Yes, exactly. And you think it's through your devices? I'm not sure. Maybe they are already here. You think it's like a physical surveillance? Yes, exactly. Mariam Shapovor was once held in solitary confinement in Tehran's notorious Avin prison. Canada was supposed to be a refuge, only something strange is happening. Family back home are being interrogated and told exact details of Mariam's life here. So the Revolutionary Guard told your sister that your apartment windows open onto a school? And is that accurate? Yes. How would they have known that? I'm not sure. So what else did they know about you? For example, I have three cats. It's really scared me. Just because of that, I ask help from police or CSIS, but uh, I haven't heard back from them. We're having this conversation just outside the University of Toronto, where there's a laboratory of sorts. We want to take your phones and your computers and see if there's any nefarious software on there keeping an eye. Destination, the Citizen Lab. Part of the work here is investigating digital espionage and attempts to surveil or harass human rights activists. They have extensive technologies that enable them to drill right down into people's personal mobile phones know where they are, with whom they're communicating, ranging all the way to hacking. Ron so. Debert and his team know these threats, alerted Saudi dissidents in Canada to spyware being implanted on their phones by that regime. They're trying to hack the Gmail. All my social accounts are on. Mariam's worries worry them too, so they need to see her phone. It's not an easy thing to talk about, and the wait to see if she's been hacked is stressful. The phone has not been hacked. In the end, they don't see spyware, but they do see nearly 35 attempts to change her Instagram password, some 18 efforts to trick her into changing her Gmail credentials. But also it's common actually for people in, in your situation to have 
agents or people who are sympathetic to the government within Canada, follow them around, maybe try to intimidate them or even physically assault them. All these things just um, really scared me. Just cut my relationship with all my Iranian friends. It was huge for me. I totally uh, isolate myself. Still recovering from the trauma of jail and interrogations, she needs and misses those connections. There is community out there, Iranian Canadians who've been taking to Canada streets to protest the regime's brutality, but that's getting risky too. I know multiple people that have been getting multiple death threats. These two say it feels like someone's trying to silence criticism of the regime, maybe lure them back to Iran or worse. Do you feel like they were watching you if you did go to those protests? Of course. I personally have witnessed multiple people trying to record people's faces. So I'm 100% sure that there are some people who are basically collecting information. Does that sound familiar to you? It sounds very familiar. Look at the lengths they're going to feel safe enough to talk. No names, no faces, not even their real voices. So what happened to you? Like a month ago, I got a text. It says, warning, communicating with the elements of the enemy abroad through email, secure portals, and other practical means of communication is criminal. It's crucial for you to disconnect. This SMS is the last security warning. So my phone rang. Sort of a Persian accent in English told me, hey, why are you posting so much about Iran on your social media? He kept repeating that. I was terrified and I dropped a call. A couple of days later, I received another no caller ID call. This time, the person knew my name. How did you get your phone number? That's a very good question. Together, they decided they had to go to police. The police officer that's in the reception, he was like, okay, but like, we can't do anything. I feel like the police, whether in Toronto or anywhere in Canada, they're late. They wait until someone dies and then they will do something. Just like Mariam, a call for help from authorities goes unanswered, even when it's now acknowledged there are active plots in Canada to target Iranian activists. And while confidence in police slips, some feel they have to do the police work themselves. People can send us information. Adashir Zazarade collects tips on possible regime figures in Canada. We are collecting information, investigating, documenting them, and probably we will publish some of the names and will uh, provide the list to the government and demand some actions. So you're doing their investigative work for them? Exactly. Well, uh, uh, we, we have to take actions in our hand because we are scared and we care about Canada's peace and security. He's the owner of a legal services firm. He spent two years in solitary confinement in Iran, only to come to Canada and get a visit at his Toronto office from an Iranian intelligence officer. Intelligence service officer just called me, my office actually, from a public phone, bail pay phone, to get an appointment. He showed up in this place, uh, in the lobby, and wanted to see me. Something was familiar about how the man was behaving and what he was asking. Adashir stopped the meeting, called the FBI, who eventually confirmed the person was a known threat. So the FBI was worried? Yeah. And they, they communicated with you? Yeah. Did the RCMP communicate at all? No, the RCMP never responded to my messages. What's wrong with the government? Why they are not taking action? Good question. Think again about Mariam sitting in the citizen lab learning how to protect herself online. Their help matters. To speak out in Iran is beyond brave. It shouldn't have to be in Canada. So we reached out to CSIS, the Minister of Public Safety and the RCMP for comment. The RCMP were the only ones who got back to us in time, saying they believe the problem is growing and that they have ongoing investigations into threats to Canadians from the Revolutionary Guards. But they couldn't say how widespread these threats are due to, quote, underreporting. That raises questions about just how prepared the system is to handle them. We'll have more on the story soon, as will the Fifth Estate, next week. Now, this is the final week the Emergencies Act inquiry will hear from witnesses. What we heard repeatedly in the first early weeks was you couldn't get truckers to do anything they didn't want to do. Up next, David Common reveals what we've learned and what happens next. Plus... My son is in the World Cup! My son is in the World Cup! You go, a proud moment for Canada and moms everywhere.
In the next couple of days, we're going to hear some high-profile testimony at the Emergencies Act inquiry. The federal government invoked it to end convoy protesters' occupation of downtown Ottawa last winter. And now the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister will be questioned about what led up to that moment. As David Common shows us, whatever they say will just add to the string of revelations so far about what happened and what went wrong. Back. This was the culmination of a three-week occupation, ending only after unprecedented legal and police action. We were here then. So what we're going to have to do is get over the fence line just to get out. And now we're back with a better understanding of what happened, how, and whether it might have been avoided. Picking up clues from the inquiry that's examining whether the use of the Emergencies Act was warranted. We're learning police were then in crisis. Protesters without a unified leader. Some who wanted vaccine mandates gone, some from extremist groups. Realistically, negotiation, at least in Ottawa, wasn't an option. It was only going to end through enforcement. But those who would enforce were themselves disorganized and filled with infighting. We've heard a lot about, well, the police could have or should have used other options. There were things that were left for them to try. However, they weren't. Politicians unwilling or unsure about how and when to step in. A failure of political management at city and provincial levels. And now we are learning as well the federal mistakes and the federal failures. In the months leading up to the protests, online groups hinted that they wanted to shut down Ottawa over COVID measures. A memorandum appeared calling for the federal government to end vaccine mandates or resign immediately. We're going into this as, as people who have just had enough and we're, go we're not going to leave. Beginning 15 days before the convoy's arrival in Ottawa, protest leader Pat King publicly announces their plans. According to documents released to the commission, OPP intelligence warned soon after that protesters would be there for a long time. Hotels alert the city that organizers want rooms for 30 to 90 days and are planning on 10,000 people. Despite this, criminologist Michael Kempa says Ottawa police are not prepared. He's now writing a book on the police response. They concluded that it would likely be like many protests, people coming to make their point, staying for a short period of time and likely leaving. On day one, Ottawa police plan to admit 3,000 vehicles and tell protest organizers to stick to designated areas. It doesn't work out that way. Leah West is a national security and intelligence analyst. I think Ottawa police uh, believed that when they communicated with so-called protest leaders, that those protest leaders would have a grip on protesters. And what we heard repeatedly in the first early weeks was, you couldn't get truckers to do anything they didn't want to do. Trucks everywhere, parking everywhere. Complete, complete shit show. By that first weekend, protesters own the streets. Freedom! Police are barely seen, facing a staffing crunch from sick calls. It doesn't take long for Ottawa's then police chief, Peter Slowly, to realize the protesters aren't going to leave. The nine o'clock briefing that I received on the Saturday morning, the 29th, was still talking about a weekend event. That wasn't the case probably by 11 o'clock in the morning. It happened that quick. Nerves fray as Ottawa residents and businesses face a barrage of horn blasts. But protesters aren't going anywhere. On day five, GoFundMe releases a million dollars to protest leader Tamara Leach, a financial boost that extends their staying power. Behind the scenes, Ottawa's police chief asked for help. 1,800 more police officers and experts from other forces. But those other forces are reluctant to help without a plan. There's a lot of buck passing is what I'd say. Tonda McCharles has attended every day of the inquiry. Police forces are not only having arguments within their own forces, but everyone's trying to figure out, like, well, whose responsibility is it? Whose job is it? Let's give them a wake up call, boys. Give them. Frustrated, 
A private class action lawsuit demands an end to incessant honking in Ottawa as the city becomes an example of how not to address the convoy protests. One of those things was don't let them in, in around, you know, uh, the main areas of traffic, residential areas. Don't let the trucks block roads, that kind of thing. On day 10, the city of Ottawa declares a state of emergency. But when a meeting is proposed with the city, the feds and the province. The province rejected that. They didn't feel it was necessary to have uh, three orders of government at the political level to have this table. Instead, Ontario officials believe the feds could meet with protesters or give in to some of their demands by modifying vaccine mandates. Well, how do you negotiate that across the country when you're talking about federal jurisdiction, provincial jurisdiction and municipal jurisdictions? By day 13, protesters have now been blocking the Ambassador Bridge for 48 hours prompting a frank call between Ontario's Premier and the Prime Minister. The police of jurisdiction needs to do their job, Trudeau tells Ford. I can't direct them, Ford responds. I can't call them and say, get your asses in there and kicking ass. It's up to the OPP. This is when the political stakes rapidly rise. Ontario declares a state of emergency. President Biden calls Prime Minister Trudeau over the growing border blockades at the Ambassador Bridge and beyond. Freedom! 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 Over the next two days, the city of Ottawa tries to establish a deal with protesters to have them move their vehicles off residential streets. But with no one protest leader speaking for the entire group, talks fall apart. Two weeks into the protest, Ottawa police are now formulating a plan to remove the protesters. And yet, the Prime Minister and the Federal Cabinet, as far as we know, didn't know there was an operational plan that the police thought would work this time. We now know this becomes the most politically decisive period. On day 18, Ottawa's embattled police chief resigns. In Windsor, the Ambassador Bridge blockade is cleared with extensive help from the OPP, and Prime Minister Trudeau makes a historic announcement. The federal government has invoked the Emergencies Act. Trudeau's government does so after the head of CSIS, the spy agency, recommends it. Over the next few days, officers pour into Ottawa from across Canada. Okay. Protesters' bank accounts are frozen. Tow trucks compelled to provide services. It took three weeks to end this occupation. Even now, it's not clear police and politicians would be better prepared the next time. Interesting language there, David. Next time, what's the reasoning behind saying that? Well, a lot of observers say that it is just inevitable, frankly, perhaps even for the anniversary come February. Some of the things that we've learned in the inquiry is that there were other powers, other things that police and politicians could have done before the invocation of the act, but frankly, they weren't done, and perhaps that made it a bit inevitable. We've now heard mostly from the main players uh, at that inquiry. What we haven't heard from are experts. That's the next phase, and they'll be talking about what police and politicians could and perhaps should have done differently particularly if there is a next time. All right, David Cohn, thank you. Thank you. When we come back, what happens when national pride becomes a family affair? My son is in the World Cup! My son is in the World Cup! A soccer mom's best day ever in tonight's moment. Former soccer superstar David Beckham is reportedly open to throwing his support behind the right bid to buy his old team, Manchester United. Bidders may seek out Beckham to boost their chances of owning the club. It's estimated to be worth at least $6 billion Canadian. Now, the current owners say they would consider all strategic alternatives not guaranteeing an outright sale. So you are looking at the Atacubi family. Three of five kids play competitive soccer, including the eldest son, Sam. That's important because Sam is a defender for Canada's national men's team. So, and while tonight may have dashed hopes of a swift triumph for Team Canada and Sam at the World Cup, 
Sam Adekube can count on the devotion of one fan in particular, his mom, Dee. Her incandescent motherly pride is tonight's moment. My son is in the World Cup! My son is in the World Cup! Yeah, baby! As Sam, raised in Calgary, made his way to the top. Sam! His mother, Dee, has been posting her proudest moments on Twitter. Look at my wife. <laughs> That's all she knows to do, just praise God. Mom, are you crying? And her latest, posted just this afternoon, showed that pride overflowing. My son is in the World Cup! My son is in the World Cup! Yeah, baby! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> There's nothing like a good mom. So uh, the family's motto is Atacubi strong. And of course, um, Sam, you've got some competition from your younger brother, Elijah, who's been playing with the Calgary Cavalry for four seasons. He has his eyes on you. That is the national for November 23rd. Thanks for being with us. Have a good night.